Well, actually, this is this is just fine. This is good. Um, because just what's kind of what's in my heart, as I was driving home last night and then driving back again, <laughs> to spending time with the Lord. I just kind of kept getting just a couple like thoughts, almost like, you know, wrap a few things up here. Put these little. I, the way I pointed it out last night, I was I was going to give you a few pointers. <laughs> So let me give you a couple more pointers just to kind of wrap things up. Now, I know we have another service, but just, we'll see where that all goes. <laughs> Amen. But, and so, I, I'm just going to share with you what the Lord was really putting on my heart. And One of the things was this, is that last night I, I mentioned something about marriage, no intention to do that, but it just turned out that way. And so it kind of stirred some conversation and different things like that. And, and um, I mentioned that in a marriage relationship that the husband uh, has the greater responsibility. And, um, <clears throat> and the Bible does say that, I mean, he's the head of the union, but all that that means is, is that when you're in, you are the head of something, it means you have the responsibility for it. The buck stops with you. And, um, and the husbands are told that they're to love their wives like Christ loves the church. And he gave his life for the church. Yep. And so husbands are to give their lives for their wives. And if that union is in trouble, I made this statement, that it's the primary responsibility for that union being in trouble rests with the husband. And if it's going to get fixed, then he better start doing some things to fix it. That's right. yep. And not being trying to put blame over onto his wife and thinking that she's the one that needs to initiate something to try and fix this thing. No, he better. Amen. Amen. And so this was just stirring in my heart. Is to give you an example, this is how I do it. Now I'm, in, I'm right now in a rather unique situation because I'm the primary caregiver for my wife. And, um, but I've, I've always functioned this way. But it just has become more real to me now in, more, in recent years. Is that, see, I love my wife like Christ loves the church, and so I'm giving myself for her. So everything that she needs takes priority over anything I need. Mm -hmm. That's right. It does. Yep. Right. And what I've learned to do is this. Because, see, I... I'm a guy just like other guys. Guys like toys. We do. We like toys. I mean, we played with toys when we, when we were kids. We had trucks and so forth and so on. We like toys. And, the, you know, the whole joke is in the world is that, you know, when guys get older, they still like the toys. They just cost a whole lot more now. <laughs> or that little truck they used to play with cost $10 and now... Now they cost like $100,000. And uh, so, but this is, this is what I've done. See, I put all her needs above mine. And so how I function is I'm trusting God. I like toys, but my wife's needs become first. And so I'll provide anything that she needs disregarding anything that I might like or that I might want. And I just trust God. That's it. And it's been amazing. <laughs> the toys that he just gives me. But see, you've got to put your wife first. He'll give you everything that you desire. But you make sure that she's first. That she's number one. Just a little nugget. 
Now, that has nothing to do with the gifts of the Spirit, obviously. But it's kind of wrapping some thoughts up. Because we need to get it right, people. Right. Amen. And, um, you know, we talk about the things with, uh, you know, young people. And we've worked with youth for years. And it's, just, it, it's actually just amazing um, the youth that would come to our youth camps and the rallies, different things that we've done and um, the challenges that they're facing. And, and so much of it just comes right back to, for one, fathers not being in the home. And, uh, and the statistics are even all there. Even the percentage of, of men that are in prison that you know, are, come from fatherless families, is, that percentage is just huge. And so there, there's a crisis, really. But if we would get it right in our marriages, and if men would take their responsibility and love their wife like Christ loves the church, we wouldn't be having the crisis that we have. But anyway. Now, the other thought I had was this. Is that, and we've talked much about the, the gifts of the Spirit and God's done things and, and, um, and, and certainly He wants to do more. But we need to be positioned to um, work with Him. And um, one of the things also that's very helpful in God using you is that you have to be you. You have to be you. Yeah. Yeah. See, God wants you to be you. And he'll use you who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We have to be kind of careful when we, we, we and I know even from a, a standpoint of a preacher that's endeavoring to help teach people, I don't want to leave the impression in teaching someone that you have to do it like me. Because you may not do things at all like me. But we do want to try and help you <laughs> to yield to him and, and uh, allow him to work through you and be who you are. Yes. Because if we look at the scriptures, we see that there, the comparison is made in the body of Christ and how these members are placed in the body of Christ. It, it compares it to our physical bodies. Real clear example, obviously, it's other places, but obviously right there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so when you think of your physical body, well, you got all these members. But they don't all have the same function or use. And they don't even act the same. My heart does not act at all like my lungs. But I'm glad my lungs are doing their job and my heart's doing this job. I'm glad about that. But see, we would have disarray within our physical bodies if we've got all of these different limbs and organs and so forth trying to, to be something that they're not, yeah. Yeah. It, it won't work very good. Mm -hmm. And so he needs us to be who we are. Yeah. See, it was interesting because last night after the service, Vernon kind of says to me, I was getting ready to leave, and he says, well, you know, if you could, maybe it'd be nice if you could review a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit, talk a little bit more about those and, and then share some more experiences of how God's used, within, used you in these areas so we could learn from that. And so I was driving home and I was thinking about that and just fellowshipping with the Lord. And, um, and I thought, I don't know, I mean, and this, this is the kind of thought I had. I said, well, all the, the, the experiences that I've had, they've kind of just been kind of boring. There wasn't much spectacular about them at all. Because all I've ever done is just, I've just had that witness on the inside. Angels haven't appeared to me or anything. I, there's just that witness on the inside, and I've learned to follow that, that knowing that comes. And in the beginning, when it first started happening, I, yeah, I mean, it took all the faith I had just to step out <laughs> and to open my mouth and say something. And it was with fear and trembling. Yeah. But as you, you learn to trust that, well, you get bolder and bolder and bolder in it. But it's just, it's just everyday life. 
But see, to be honest, that's just who I am. See, if you want to describe me, you know, some people, some people are like this. Here's Brad. Amen. He's just like this all the time. Something really interesting happens, I go, well, that's nice. I had a, a well, not had, but I had a friend of mine, and uh, we were golfing one time, this was a few years ago, and somehow he managed to sneak one of those exploding golf balls. I don't know how he did it, because I'm usually not that gullible, but he managed to sneak this thing in. And uh, so I, I tee that ball up. I hit that thing with my driver, and it just blows up. And, and he tells the story, because it just exploded. And we were paired up with some other guys in the golf course that didn't know us at all, because they'll do that sometimes, to put you together with somebody. And so this ball just, just explodes. And uh, I just, I looked back at, you know, my friend, and I just kind of went. <laughs> and I grabbed another ball, put it down, and I hit the ball in about, you know, 275, 300 yards straight down the middle. Because, see, that's just, I didn't react to it. That's just who I am. But, you know, God uses me the way I am. And he's going to use you the way you are. I don't get excited. Now, have, I, have we experienced some really supernatural things? Yeah. Amazing things. I, I shared that. Man, we, we've been translated. That's pretty spectacular, but it was, it's kind of like, well, okay, whatever. I didn't get out of my vehicle after we finally <laughs> were in the place where God put us and start running around the vehicle rejoicing and jumping up and down. It was kind of like, well, cool. Here we are. <laughs> but see, that's just who I am. You may not be that way, but that's who I am. We had one of our meetings, one of our youth camps, and this is, we've actually seen several times where the, the presence of God has filled a meeting and uh, where it's, he manifests in a cloud. And you can see that within the scriptures. That happened. But one of our youth camps, we had that. It was just in a morning session. It wasn't, wasn't even an evening session. Just in the morning. And all we, we would do at the morning, we'd just have a few shorter teaching sessions in the mornings at camp. And uh, so we're, we're all in this tabernacle, and, and I, I was just up teaching, real simple. <laughs> and, um, and all of a sudden, just this, this cloud filled this whole tabernacle. And every single person in there saw it. And so I, I'm teaching, and some of my other workers, they were in the back playing around. They were trying, because you, you know how the, the sun will shine through sometimes in a window, and you can see the dust particles? But you can move them around. If you put your hand through it, the dust particles will move around. Well, that's the way this, this cloud was. That field that just sparkled all over the place. And, and, but you could see these, like, these sparkly things there, and some of my workers in the back, they were trying to get it to move like dust does. Well, it didn't work that way. But I was up there teaching, and then, I mean, this cloud fills the place, and it was like, oh, huh, cool. <laughs> and you know what I did? I just kept on teaching. <laughs> well, because, I don't know, I mean, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> But see, that's, that's just me. See, and God wants to use you who you are. Mm -hmm. Amen. And see, it's interesting because as we've experienced different things and even coming in the churches and even through the years I've worked with so many ministers that see, I come into places and things kind of just settle. Jim Casement has that effect, too. But Jim, in some ways, he's kind of like me. He's just yeah. like this. <laughs> I had a, when I was pastoring one of my churches, there was this young lady 
that um, just an incredible singer, incredible voice. And um, she was in my worship band. She tried out for um, a very well-known Christian uh, worship team. I won't tell you who they are, but very well-known. And uh, she was first alternate. She didn't make the team, but she was a first alternate. That's how good she was. And, but she was in our church. But she had this anointing that would just bring peace. And we'd tease her all the time because we said, you got the sleeping anointing. <laughs> because she'd start, she'd start worshiping God. And, and I mean, just this peace would come in and everybody would just get so calm and relaxed and we'd tease her. You're putting everybody to sleep. And, uh, but see, that was just who she is. And God used her that way. And so we got to get comfortable who, with who we are and how he's using us. Because not, you may not do things exactly like me. And see, when I was young in ministry, and you're just learning and growing and stuff, I can remember one time I, I'd gone to this meeting with this gentleman, and he was just this fireball preacher. I mean, just like going after it and I thought this is really cool I really like this and so I, I and I was pastoring my first church but just young in ministry and uh, so I said oh man I, next Sunday I, I'm doing that we're gonna have just this you know spitting just fireball preaching service and I got up there and I tried everything <laughs> in my power that I could to try and get something like that to happen and I'm trying to imitate him and be like this and it's like going like this. And I finally, I finally just to myself and said, well, this isn't working. And I just went back to being who I was. See, be who you are. We can, we can move with the Spirit of God He'll lead us, guide us. He'll use us in these gifts, but be who you are. And let him use you the way that he wants to use you. Amen. 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 So, that was a little nugget I thought I'd tell you about. The other, the other little nugget is this. And we mentioned this. Is that if we're going to have more of the gifts of the Spirit and manifestation and see God use us in those things. And remember, it's always about helping other people. And, um, and I mentioned this last night. We have to be people that pray in tongues. We really do. And I shared that there was a great man of God that I sat under for years, and he'd make this statement. He said that tongues is the door to the supernatural. And he would make that statement, and I, you never disagreed with that statement, but didn't really totally understand it. But as I grew, I began to understand it more and more. And, and this is the other little nugget I want to give with, to you today. Um, the Bible says, and I, and I, without me going, taking all the time to read all the scriptures, but the Bible says there in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul made this statement. He said, if I pray or speak in this supernatural language, in tongues, he says, it's my spirit that prays. Yes. Yeah. That's what he said. He said, it's my spirit that prays. So when we're praying in tongues, it's our spirit that's praying. Mm -hmm. And just to think of it in a real natural way, so much of our life, our, our voices, you could say, are connected to here. But when we pray in tongues, there's a disconnect that takes place from here. And all of a sudden, we're yielding in our voices. We're getting our spirit is speaking. Yeah. See, it's not coming here, it's here. Mm -hmm. That's why you can pray in tongues and do all kinds of other things. I, I've done it just to be fun. <laughs> Said, okay, I'm going to go and do a bunch of a math calculation while I'm praying in tongues and see if I can do it. <laughs> you sure can. Because you can just do it with your mind because it, your spirit's praying. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so when, when we pray in these tongues, it's our spirit praying. Okay. 
But where's, who's giving us the utterance? Ah. Oh. Isn't that what it says? The Spirit gave them under Acts chapter 1. Or Acts chapter 2, excuse me. Acts chapter 2. Where they were all filled, see, there in the day of Pentecost. They begin to speak in these other tongues, but it says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, I'm speaking, me, my Spirit speaking, but the Holy Spirit is giving me the utterance. Okay? Now, and I speak in this supernatural language. It also said this, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, he says that when we speak in these tongues, that we're not speaking unto men, we're speaking unto God, but then it says we speak mysteries. How be it in the Spirit we speak mysteries. So when I'm speaking in this supernatural language, the Bible says I'm speaking mysteries. Have you ever thought about that? What are those mysteries? What are you actually saying? I certainly don't believe that it's just small talk. It says I'm talking to God, so he's speaking unto him. It's not like, hi, how are you today? How's your day going? It's not that. It's, to me, it's much, much higher than that. It's a very supernatural communication. But it says you're speaking mysteries. Well, if you do just a little bit of research on that whole idea of, of these mysteries, you find out like over in, in Romans chapter 16, where it talks about the mysteries, but it says that these, these mysteries are the gospel. It's revelation of God's redemptive plan. And so when I'm speaking, as the Spirit's given me these utterance, see, I'm speaking these mysteries, but what these mysteries are, it has to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has to do with the revelation of what Jesus did for me. It has to do really with God's redemptive plan. And so I'm speaking things that have to do with the kingdom of God. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about it is, see, that I'm part of that redemptive plan. I'm part of that mystery. You're part of that mystery. And so you can be speaking things concerning your own life. You can be speaking things concerning other people's lives. You can be speaking something that has to do with some member of the body of Christ that's on the other side of the earth someplace. You're speaking mysteries, but what these mysteries are, see, it's, the, it's this gospel, it's the redemptive plan, it's God's plans, what he's doing. And so you're speaking this supernatural language. All right. Now, and we can say much more about all this, but I just want to give you a little pointer. Is that, okay, so here, the Spirit's giving me utterance, but my Spirit's praying. So guess what happens? When I'm speaking by the Spirit, speaking in the supernatural language, these tongues, it's my Spirit praying, the Spirit's giving me the utterance, and so what happens is, is that now there comes a knowing to my Spirit of what's going on. Yeah. See, the things of the Spirit, it says, like in 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 2, it talks about how these things are spiritually discerned. And that we won't figure it out with this head up here. They're, they're spiritually discerned. It's the Spirit that He searches the deep things of God. See, and, and these, these things are revealed unto us. And so, as this communication is coming through, in which my spirit's praying, but the Holy Spirit's giving me the utterance. The Holy Spirit isn't praying. My spirit's praying. But he's giving me the utterance. And so, when you get that flow of that supernatural utterance, and remember, the, it's mysteries. These mysteries have to do with God's plans and purposes and so forth. And so now, I'm praying these things, and so what happens is, then enlightenment comes. And so I can be praying in the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah. yeah. I see something. I realize something. I can get revelation concerning maybe something in the Word. I can, something can be revealed. All of a sudden I realize it. Oh. 
I need to do this. Do that. See, I need to talk to that person. I need to say this to that person. But see, that is so much initiated by us praying in tongues. Yeah. If we choose not to do that, if we, and it talks about there in 1 first, in first Corinthians, if we choose to just live our lives that way with, through our natural thinking, it says we're going to miss these things. Because our, our natural man can't figure those things out. But man, it can be revealed to me. But what do I need to do? Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues. Amen. Amen. And all of a sudden you, you know something. Revelation comes. Something's revealed. Paul prayed in one of his prayers that's recorded there in Ephesians. He prayed that um, people, that they'd have this spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation and the knowledge of him. Now, I've heard different preachers talk about the spirit of seeing and knowing, and that's really what they're referring to is what Paul had said there. And a lot of, I've been hearing this from a lot of different ones around the body of Christ, talking about that in these last days, see, that spirit of seeing and knowing would be more prevalent than ever. Well, that's what we need to know. We need to be able to see things correctly from a spiritual standpoint. We need to know things. And in the way that we're going to then begin to move over into the supernatural, see, tongues is the doorway to the supernatural, is that we need to be a people that's praying in tongues. Yep. Amen. And it, opened up, it opens up avenues for me to know something. I can be just out there <laughs> fellowshipping with God, praying in tongues. Like I say, kind of minding my own business. And all of a sudden, something happens. Well, all of a sudden, I know something. And it may have to do with somebody else. Maybe he shows me something concerning my own life, my own ministry. But see, it was all because I was praying these things out. And so if we're going to see more of the gifts of the Spirit in operation, then we need to be a people that pray in tongues. And we all can do that if we're filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen.